hopefully um, I'll give you an interesting presentation um, and I'll just talk through some of the stuff that I've been involved with. Um, some of the misinformation you might have heard around the aviation industry, I'll try and give a brief um, whistle stop tour around all of that um, and kind of get to where I think we need to go to with policy on, on the sector and the sort of stuff that I'm campaigning for. Um, so yeah, thanks for having me and I'll, well, I'll, I'll share my screen. Um, and yeah, I think we'll have a question and answer session at the end as well. Um, so if, you, if there's anything that you're interested in as I'm going along, um, let me know in the chat and we can, we can come back to it at the end. Okay, so this is a pack that uh, I've created on sustainable aviation, but the question mark there, because it, is it really possible? Um, I'm, as I say, I'm Finlay Asher. I'm based in Scotland. Um, a little bit of a background about me. Um, I'm a mechanical aerospace engineer. I'm currently involved with two groups. The first one is Safe Landing, which is a group for aviation workers in the sector that are concerned about climate change. Um, and Green Sky Thinking, which is my YouTube channel where I explore the reality behind different technological solutions um, um, and policies and stuff. Um, sort of stuff I'm going to be discussing here. I, I go into a bit more detail in those videos, but they're all sort of three, four minutes long. Um, in terms of my background, I spent seven years at Rolls-Royce, um, mainly working on future aircraft engine design um, with Boeing and Airbus. Yeah, so... A lot of what I, of, of what I did was um, working in the future programs team. Um, Airbus or Boeing would be looking, you know, within the aviation industry, we look on a 10, 15, 20 year horizon at what's coming next. Um, so we were looking um, a lot of the time at what would sort of mid 2030s. Uh, we were already like a couple of years ago, designing aircraft and aircraft engine concepts. Um, for the 2030s then. I worked on a couple of programs. The first one's called Ultrafan, which is uh, Rolls-Royce's biggest engine ever. This huge fan at the front and a gearbox in the middle, um, which, which is a novel concept for them. Um, even further into the future, something called the variable pitch fan, which is the big fan blades at the front of the engine rotating, um, which means you can basically optimize the efficiency of the engines when they are at different altitudes and during different phases of the mission. Um, so that's quite a, an extra, like additional complex sort of future concept that we might see, but again, probably gonna take 15, 20 years before we see that. Um, so what what happened, just a bit, bit of background. In April, 2019, we had the Extinction Rebellion protests um, and really the, the topic of climate change got back on the political agenda in a big way with the government declaring a climate emergency, Greta Thunberg um, crossing the Atlantic rather than flying. And there was a big focus on sort of high emissions intensity activities. And there's a lot of focus on flying. Um, and the aviation industry responded to this by getting together at the Paris Air Show, which was mid 2019 and producing this joint statement um, so all of the chief technology officers from the biggest companies in the industry, Airbus, Boeing, Dassault, who are Fran French, GE, who are um, American engine makers, Rolls-Royce, my company, um, Safran from France, United Technologies, another massive American company. And they gave this joint statement about what they were doing about sustainability, um, that what their strategy is, and basically saying, like, you, you don't need to regulate us anymore. We know what we're doing. We've got these technologies. We've got it sorted. Um, so basically my chief technology officer, Paul, um, was one of the main architects of this statement. And I read it and I just really disagreed with a lot of, of what it said. Um, and I formed an employee sustainability group that was a group of employees that would get together, we'd share information, we'd present on different topics to each other, and we'd look to challenge the corporate sustainability strategy. Um, and I was doing that for maybe half a year, a year or so, um, and just decided to quit my job middle of last year, mid 2020. Um, obviously, there's a lot less flights um, happening in, because of COVID, um, and it, it was a good time to leave. But I also thought, like, this is such a pivotal moment. We've got COP26 happening in Glasgow now at the end of this year. There's the Scottish elections. 
Um, the, the UK government's updating their carbon budget in the middle of this year. Um, the aviation industry, there's a lot less flights. We've got a real choice now about where we go next, whether we expand, whether we um, take the carbon budget seriously. Um, so I think it's a really pivotal moment and it felt like I need, I need to leave and just campaign on this stuff externally because I can maybe have more, hopefully have more impact. So yeah, so what I do now, I've got this channel called Green Sky Thinking, which is on YouTube and you can check it out and have a look at those videos. Um, and I also have this group called Safe Landing, which we've started and we're looking to get together workers from across the industry. So there's pilots and there's engineers, but also that, you know, open to cabin crew, people that work at the airports, people that work in the factories and sort of say, as a group of workers, we actually want to challenge what our leaders are saying have a look at some of those narratives and the stories that are being told and say, do we actually believe this as employees? And if we want a stable and secure future um, of employment, we want a realistic strategy that's actually gonna come true and isn't gonna lead us to another crash similar to COVID in another 10 years. So that's safe landing. Um, so just to talk through what the industry, when it comes to sustainable aviation, um, the industry uses what I call the sustainability playbook. It's like a series of narratives they use to justify future growth and future rapid growth, right? Um, and the first thing, the first element of this is just really playing down the size of the problem. So if you have a look at any um, aviation company website or media statement, they, they always say, aviation only produces two to 3% of global CO2 emissions. And that makes you think, oh, that's a very small part of the pie. A bit, a bit, you know, there's no point in looking at aviation, 3%, what is that? That's nothing. Well, you know, just for context, that's more than the emissions of UK, Mexico, or Brazil. And you wouldn't say the UK is less than 2%, so we don't need to take any action on emissions in the UK, right? So 3% of CO2 emissions is a lot, but, Really, the problem is the trajectory. So aviation plans to grow, it plans to double or triple by 2050, um, and it doesn't really have a decarbonisation strategy. So whereas for road transport, for industry, for, for domestic home heating, we, can, we know how we can decarbonise those sectors, aviation just doesn't really have a viable strategy. And it's projected to consume more like a quarter of CO2 emissions by 2050. So that's obviously a much bigger share. The next thing is that CO2 isn't the only problem. So there's also these non-CO2 impacts. So there's, there's NOx, nitrogen oxide, water vapor, soot, aerosol, and contrail formations to so the clouds behind the aircraft. And they, the, the latest science shows that those contribute um, and basically mean that aviation warms the climate three times faster than just the CO2 emissions alone. So the CO2 are basically one third of, of the global warming impact and the other two thirds come from the contrails. So actually it, it's really more like 6% of the global warming impact right now. And it's gonna be more than 25% in the future unless we deal with the contrails as well. So hopefully that gives you an idea that this is actually a, a pretty big problem and we really need to think about what we're gonna do about aviation. Okay, the, the next thing is just how those emissions are distributed because um, it's actually only 1% of the world's population that produces 50% of the commercial aviation emissions. So it's a very small fraction of society that's flying and producing all of the emissions. And actually only 20% of people have ever been on an aircraft and 80% of the world's population have just never set foot on a plane. So that 6% um, I was saying about, you know, it's, it's only a very small proportion of society that are creating this huge amount of emissions. Um, so given how many, how few people do it, that's a very big share as well. Okay, so how do the industry then in that case justify growth? They, they want to double the, the number of aircraft in the next 20 years. Well, they use these, what I'm going to call the four pillars. Um, the first one is they talk about efficiency improvements. They say aircraft and engines get more efficient every year, and that reduces the emissions. They, they look at electric flight, so like electric cars, have electric planes powered by batteries. There's so-called sustainable aviation fuels, things like biofuels, um, hydrogen or synthetic fuels, 
that can replace traditional um, um, aviation fuel, which is called kerosene. Um, and then there's carbon offsetting schemes as well. So if we go through those one at a time, the first one is aircraft efficiency. And this is obviously like my bread and butter. It's what I spent all my time doing. Um, and we, we do make, you know, we'd be making aircraft and engines more efficient every year. Like they're 20% more efficient than they were um, 20 years ago. Um, and, and when you look at just one flight, you think, okay, well, 20% more efficient. You've done one flight, you've burned 20% less fuel. We've had a fuel saving. The problem with, with, with that kind of simple mentality is that at the same time, we've had this huge explosion in air traffic growth. And actually the fact that the engines are more efficient means that the flights are cheaper and people fly more often and they fly further. And if you look at passenger kilometers with time, it's on this like exponential increase upwards. Um, and the result is that far outweighs and far outpaces any efficiency gains that we get. Um, and what it means is this is a plot of aviation emissions with time. That's the red line. And you can see that those emissions are just going up and up and up. So even though the average flight today compared to 50 years ago burns less fuel, the fact that we're flying 10 times as much means the emissions are just going up. So, and that's all that matters, right? The only thing that matters to the, the planet, uh, the only thing it sees is total emissions that go into the atmosphere. And demonstrably, they are increasing and efficiency improvements aren't helping. And this is kind of one of the main things I realized as an engineer. So if that, my, all of my efforts are going to nothing really, um, because the air traffic growth is, is not constrained. Um, and this is just gonna continue into the future um, unless we bring in some policies. So the next thing is electric flight. Um, there's a lot of new startups um, small companies getting a lot of investment. They claim to be producing first electric aircraft, so um, electric motors powered by batteries. Um, the crux of this really though is a battery, um, it just can't store the same amount of energy jet fuel can. And also when you um, burn jet fuel, the mass disappears and your aircraft gets lighter. So if you fly between London and New York, you get halfway across the Atlantic, you burn off half your fuel roughly, and the aircraft's a lot lighter, um, and it becomes much more efficient with time because it needs less thrust to keep it in the sky. With a battery, you don't burn off the fuel, the battery stays the same weight. And this really limits how far you can fly with an electric aircraft. So it's only really viable for very small aircraft flying very short distances. Think five to 10 people flying for about one hour. And then you realize this isn't a competitor um, for the vast majority of air travel and the vast majority of emissions that are produced. Like in the UK, domestic aviation is only a very small percentage of total emissions, whereas international aviation makes up 96% of emissions and electric aircraft can't compete there. Um, and when you look at these small scales where, where, it, where it is possible, it's way more efficient to use ground transport. So use a, a bus, a coach, a train or a ferry um, rather than fly, just because you, you don't take off um, and, and that uses lots of energy. So we, we shouldn't really, electric flight don't really help with much and where they do help, we're better using a different solution. Moving on to hydrogen flight. So hydrogen, um, the good thing about hydrogen is it weighs a lot less than batteries. Um, so you don't have the weight problem associated with batteries, but you do have a volume problem. So this is why this is a hydrogen concept aircraft. Um, hydrogen is four times the volume of jet fuel, um, even when it's compressed to a liquid. So it just means the aircraft ends up being huge and bulky, um, or you have to get start getting rid of passengers to make space for the hydrogen tanks. Um, so it's really only viable for medium aircraft flying medium distances. Um, it, it, it will still also won't be able to go very far because of the, the increased volume and weight. But one of the key things with hydrogen is it's also just the time scales. It will take sort of 15 years to develop and certify the first aircraft. That's a very aggressive time scale as well. Um, probably more like 2040. And even once you've got a new aircraft, it takes probably 20, 30 years to roll out an aircraft and replace all, your, all of the, the aircraft currently in service with the new type. 
Um, so hydrogen, basically, when you look at it, it's not really going to be a big player until after 2050. And even then, we really don't know if it really is better than using other fuels. Um, so it requires very different aircraft, which means you also you need very different airport configurations. And you also need huge amounts of energy to produce the hydrogen as well. And there's an argument of, well, is that a good use of energy when we also need to decarbonize the rest of our economy? So if we can't use hydrogen and electric isn't really going to help, what about alternative jet fuels? So basically a, a hydrocarbon, an oil that goes into a plane and can it's exactly the same properties and it can replace fossil fuel. So the problem with fossil fuel is obviously it's carbon that's deep underground. We extract it, we process it, and we put it in our cars and in our planes and in our power plants. And that they, it burns and the CO2 and other greenhouse gas goes into the atmosphere and the concentrations of CO2 in the atmosphere are increasing with time. Well, alternative jet fuel, what we do is we, we take carbon that's already in the atmosphere. So from trees or plants, that's biofuel. You can also get water and you can process that to make hydrogen. And if you also extract CO2, either from a power plant, like a power station, or direct air capture is where you suck it from the air using these big fans. You've got some carbon and you've got some hydrogen. You can combine that um, to make uh, um, a synthetic fuel. And if you power that process with renewable energy, wind and solar, then you can say it's carbon neutral, um, which sounds great, right? It sounds really good. So let's take a look at biofuel first. Um, Biofuels, this is fuels that are made from biological material. So the first one is municipal waste. Um, so taking all the rubbish from our bins and processing that and making it into aviation fuel. Um, really, obviously, we shouldn't be just chucking stuff into bins. We should be recycling. We should be composting. So there shouldn't be much waste. Uh, and really, we just can't scale that to the, the quantities required for aviation. We can maybe have a bit, um, but not that much. Agricultural waste as well. Um, we can't scale that like it, that. That's taking waste from farms, um, and yeah, so we can't scale it. But also, it, it's the exact biological material that we want to use as organic fertilizer rather than fossil fuel fertilizer. So, if we're taking all of the agricultural waste, we're also removing carbon from the soils and eroding the quality of the soil. And then you've got agricultural crops. So let's just grow the energy. You know, palm oil. Uh, corn, rapeseed, um, soy oil. Now, the, you could scale that, but you're then having vast land um, requirements. You're competing for land, water, um, with farmers that are trying to grow food for a human population, which is obviously growing at a time where we're losing land because of sea level rise and because of uh, climate change and droughts. So we're, we've got all these pressures, we've got a growing human population that need more food. And then we're also going to add additional burden of energy crops on top of that, uh, which we already do, by the way, we already produce a large amount of biofuel for road transport. And, and that's been a massive ecological disaster already in terms of rainforests in South America and Southeast Asia. So we really don't want to scale those up any further. Um, so my kind of summary of biofuels is don't make David Attenborough cry and um, reject biofuels. Now I've got to say biofuels are the cornerstone of the UK aviation industry's plans to scale up and um, so it's really something we need to counter um, biofuels and the, the use of biofuels as a green solution. So synthetic fuels basically says okay well land and water resource are scarce so how about we use renewable electricity to generate fuel um, now, this is, sounds good, but it's a very, very inefficient process. So you have to put, if you have 100 kilowatts of energy, you basically, once you've produced some fuel, you, you have about 10%, 10 kilowatts. So 100 goes down to about 10 or 15. So you waste most of your energy producing this fuel. Um, just for context, I did some sums. So UK aviation fuel in 2018, we used 12 million tonnes of aviation fuel. Um, to produce that in synthetic fuel would have taken 250 terawatt hours of electricity, roughly. 
Now, that probably doesn't mean much to you, terawatt hours, 250 terawatt hours. So just for context, the UK grid generation in 2018 was 330 terawatt hours. So you can see that's about two thirds of the total grid generation all year to produce just our current consumption of fuel. Bear in mind, the industry is planning to grow. Um, you then look at, well, okay, 330, how much of that was renewable energy? Well, actually only about a third, 110 terawatt hours was renewable. So we need two times the total renewable capacity of the UK to make enough fuel just for the UK. Um, and obviously we need that electricity for other things, don't we? We need to charge all of the electric cars we're about to put out on the roads and all that sort of stuff as well. So uh, synthetic kerosene, it produces uh, a big question of how to use resource and what and where and why and where to use it efficiently and not waste it, as well as just the, the cost. So because it's so inefficient, it costs five times the cost of conventional fuel. So if the industry wants to use it, they're going to have to pay for it. Um, and everyone's, everyone's talking about cheap flying still and flying's not going to get more expensive. So, sorry, I'm just like rattling through this. We're going to check what, what time it is. Carbon offsetting. Cool. Eight o'clock. So to, final things, carbon offsetting. Um, so you all um, understand what this is. Basically, you've got one group of people, they are emitting carbon. They say, well, we kind of want to keep on doing that. So we're going to offset that by paying somebody else to reduce their emissions instead. Um, now, they're... The, Kind of the UN body for for, um, for for aviation is the International Civil Aviation Organization or ICAO, um, and they came up with a scheme. Basically, pa international aviation isn't part of the Paris Agreement. Um, it, it it's been left out of, na of the national contributions um, from each of the countries, and instead, the industry has been allowed to come up with its own scheme for re reducing emissions, which it calls the Carbon Offsetting and Reduction Scheme for international aviation or Corsia. Um, so the problem with the scheme is that it only offsets emissions that exceed 2019 levels. So up until now, we've been increasing emissions, but obviously, and that's the 2019 level, but then COVID's happened. So the next few years, we won't exceed those. And then when we do, we're only gonna offset the emissions that exceed the 2019 levels and not out offset anything below that. So you can see just looking at this graph, for the considerable future, the majority of emissions will not have any offset credits applied to them at all, yeah? So the first thing is it doesn't apply to um, most CO2 emissions. The next thing is for the, the, the emissions it does apply to, the, the, there's a very low cost of offset credits. So less than $10 per tonne of CO2 from Corsia, starting about $1 and maybe going up to $12 by 2035. But actually, if you look at the cost of capturing carbon industrially at the moment, it's about $1,000. So that's more like the real cost to society. Yet the wealthiest people that are flying the most and emitting the most cannot offset most of their emissions. And the ones they do, they're going to get for less than $10. It seems like there, there's an order of magnitude um, price difference here that, that people are getting away with. The next thing is that, um, as I said, non-CO2 emissions, they account for two thirds of aviation's total climate impact. And Corsia just doesn't deal with those emissions at all. It, it doesn't have any credits, any pricing mechanism for non-CO2 emissions. So basically the scheme at the moment is just pretty ineffect ineffectual um, and it's really not adequate for reducing emissions from the industry. So what is required? I think you, you asked me to talk about that. So just briefly, um, and we can go into more detail on this if you've got questions. I think that all aviation emissions should be accounted for in nationally determined contributions um, submitted to the UN by all countries. I think that should include international aviation emissions as well as domestic, which is not done at the moment. Um, the UK recently said it would include them, but not until the 2030s. Um, and most other countries haven't agreed to include them either. I also think we should be including the non-CO2 emissions and the impacts from those as well as the CO2. Um, and I think what we need is we need an emissions price. Um, so 
both the CO2 and non-CO2 should be priced. Um, and a good way to do that is a fuel tax, because when you burn fuel, that's very proportional to the amount of emissions you produce. And currently, fuel, uh, aviation fuel is tax-free. Uh, so whereas petrol and diesel at the fuel pump, you pay maybe like 50% tax on that, there's a 0% tax rate on aviation fuel, which is quite a social and economic justice if, injustice if you think about it. Um, so I think what we need is a clear roadmap of increasing um, emissions price over the next few decades so the industry can see what the poli what policies are coming and adapt their business models for it. Um, and I also think um, we can make that progressive by using policies such as fle frequent flyer levies that maybe give people a tax-free allowance for one flight, but increase as you fly more or as you increase your air miles. Um, because really it's a small portion of society that are doing most of the flying um, and producing most of the emissions. And we wanna try and target them to bring that activity down. Um, I think there should be a zero tolerance um, for biofuels for aviation, as I discussed earlier, because of the, the ecological impact of those as well as the humanitarian impact, because often there's land conflicts that arise from putting and um, cutting down rainforests, um, creating agroforestry, um, and, and just you, you're making the cost of land go up, which means that people are more likely to have their land stolen from them. Um, and then finally, offsets should only be a mitigation. It's not a solution. Um, it doesn't stop you emitting in the first place, and that, that's really what needs to happen. And, and it should only be seen as a way of damage limitation rather rather than like the, the, the key policy. Um, so yeah, is current air traffic growth sustainable? I'd say no. And if not, what can be done to make it so? I think emissions pricing. Um, and I think an emissions price really adds to all of these things and it will actually drive and accelerate the progress on each of these things as well. Um, because, yeah, it will slow and reduce air traffic growth. It will drive pace on all of those pillars. It will push us for more efficiency improvements. It will push us towards electric and hydrogen. It will push us towards alternative fuels. Um, and it will actually accelerate a new and exciting era in aviation where we've got different aircraft and different designs rather than the same old aircraft we've had for the last 50 years, basically. So my, my kind of message to the industry is let's embrace the challenge. Um, and just kind of how that would work. Um, what we've had historically, this blue line, is air traffic growth. So we're seeing a kind of eight times increase from 2000 levels to 2050 levels. And emissions are going up. We've had efficiency gains, which is the green, which drops the emissions, but you can see the red. Um, the total emissions is still increasing. So air traffic growth is exceeding our efficiency gains, if that makes sense. And what I think should happen is we need to limit air traffic growth. So that blue line, rather than being unconstrained and increasing into the future, limit that so that when we have our efficiency improvements, they are actually reducing emissions and we're heading towards zero emissions for 2050 or earlier. So yeah, that's my, um, yeah, I've got some other slides, but I'll, I'll stop there because I think I've got, I've covered a lot of ground and I've gone into a lot of detail. So I'm keen to take any questions um, from you all and I can I can maybe use some other slides if they're useful.